Ubisoft is a video game company that I find absolutely fascinating. This is a brand which has managed to cultivate some of the most beloved series in gaming history, sprout studios in as nearly as many countries as the British Empire, and employ enough people to make up a small city. At the same time, and despite its scale, the company has almost become infamous for its bafflingly consistent mediocrity, becoming the very personification of a B plus student. Its consistency has become so legendary that it's hard to remember the last time one of their titles scored outside of the 7.5 to 8.5 range in living memory, never falling to truly bad, but never rising to real greatness. As a disclaimer, I'm quite a big fan of Ubisoft's titles, putting a thousand hours into Rainbow Six Siege, playing every mainline Assassin's Creed title, and on one occasion even being invited to their Sydney office. With this in mind, what I want to do today isn't praise their achievements or try to tear them down with a thumbnail that looks like this, but to try to break apart why Ubisoft seems to be incapable of hitting those 9s and 10s, and how I believe they're not playing to their strengths. Before we get there, let's talk about some of their weaknesses. I've mentioned this a lot in the past, but over the last five years, I haven't been able to stand Ubisoft's writing. Let's break this down on a case-by-case -case basis. I've always said that Ubisoft has never necessarily been good at writing an overarching story, but have instead been able to create characters who are at the very least compelling and memorable. In recent years, however, it seems as if even this has become deprioritized. The Watch Dogs series went from having a cast of memorable characters led by the goofy and confident Marques Brown Lee, to literally not having a main character at all. The Assassin's Creed series is arguably worse, going from protagonists like Ezio and Edward Kenway, who were just dripping with charisma, to more blank slate characters. Basim seemed so fucking cool when you weren't actually playing him in Valhalla, but in Assassin's Creed Mirage, he was just a stoic plank of wood. Half the time, it felt like he was in a play reading his lines from the back of his hand. Like, here are a few scenes side by side from two games around a decade apart, and you tell me which ones look better. Our uncle is un monstro. This is outrageous. What's happened? He's making me work. Who goes there? Salve to you too. That's you. I was expecting my wife. Somehow that does not surprise me. What fresh brew do you have for me today, Kong? No brew until Luca returns my crate. But if you have come to buy tea, I have many recommendations. <laughs> Kong, it is me, Basim. Huh. Who? Basim. It gets even worse when the characters seem to be actively bringing down the games that don't really deserve to suffer such weak characters in the story. The newest Avatar game is legitimately the best looking title to come out of 2023, and most people didn't even notice. I could probably make an entire video on the exact moment the player transitions from the sanitary confines of the starting human base to the breathtaking wilds of Pandora's wilderness, and it genuinely gives you whiplash with how good the game looks. With this in mind, it was just so fucking hard to connect to the main character, when for whatever fucking reason, they sounded like they were being voiced by Morty. But the RDA left, didn't they? And you left us here. Far Cry seems to be a title which actually manages to escape this story and writing curse, but this is mostly because Ubisoft invests a lot of money to hire big name actors to squeeze into a mocap suit. In any case, the charismatic villains have always stolen the show, and oftentimes this is enough to trick us into thinking the rest of the story is actually any good. It's kinda hard to criticize the plot when Giancarlo Esposito is just so fucking good at playing the villain. As for anything with the words Tom Clancy in the name, I probably don't even have to mention that the writing is very much seen as an afterthought. What are you gonna do, sir? You gonna charge me? You know something that'd be worth it? This here's about what's right. What's right? Murdering an officer of the United States Army is right? I suppose books from a writer who often went into meticulous technical detail don't translate all that well into the video game space. Then again, no one in the history of the world ever played Breakpoint for the compelling dialogue. Beyond writing, it also seems as if Ubisoft never aim for their games scoring a 10, which is why they seem to so consistently hit around an 8. 
Although the gap between an 8 and a 10 seems small, it's likely that management simply don't deem it worthwhile to spend what might be an extra few years trying to reach these higher milestones. Assassin's Creed Valhalla didn't have the best combat, stealth, free running, or story, even against games in its own series, but still managed to rake in a billion dollars since launch. Although clearly not a masterpiece, you can't argue with the results. Their inability to get a 10 isn't even a skill issue, because as I've always said, if you let Ubisoft cook long enough, they can make some crazy impressive st- Hey, not you! Get the fuck out of here, Skull and Bone! Perhaps most amazingly, although Assassin's Creed is by far its best performing series, most players still consider Ghosts of Tsushima to be the best Assassin's Creed game anyway. A title which isn't even made by Ubisoft. With the upcoming Assassin's Creed Red also set in Japan, Ubisoft really can't afford to be outdone by a five-year-old game, by a company 20 times smaller, who made their title in, in a cave, cave with, with a, a box, box of scraps. scraps. Although many critics will often point to Ubisoft titles being rightfully derivative of their own work, in my admittedly humble opinion, I think this might be one of their greatest strengths. Being able to internally collaborate and easily port systems and ideas from one game to another is such a huge strength for the company. Company. And this is the foundation on which they can improve. As strange as it sounds, Ubisoft's biggest strength seems to be almost everything that isn't actually related to making a good game. And for this point, you'll have to let me cook. This is a company that can obviously collaborate and pull talent incredibly well. It has incredible internal infrastructure to pull off pretty much any needs their game may require. And I've personally found their ability to collaborate with creators extremely impressive. Not only this, but in an era where most games are releasing unoptimized and underbaked. Ubisoft has strangely become the gold standard for PC launches. In fact, in the recent case of Avatar, they've even included a hidden graphic setting beyond Ultra, which is designed to somewhat future-proof the game. I'm calling it now. Frontiers of Pandora is going to be the subject of two-hour video game essays long into the future. On top of this, their community support is pretty fucking nuts when you actually pay attention. Rainbow Six Siege started with 20 playable operators in 2015, but over time that's grown to over 70, with the company long vowing to push it to 100. I'd expect that most viewers also didn't know that For Honor is still receiving new content to this day, because if there are people willing to play, Ubisoft is happy to keep pushing out the goods. This is a company which can pull off its own cloud streaming, create some of the best historical teaching tools ever made, and even map out the Notre Dame so well that their files could help in its restoration effort. In this sense, this is what I mean by the company being really good at anything that isn't making a good game. Which might not seem like a good foundation, but it's actually a really good starting point. I think that Ubisoft as a company, at least how it's currently structured, needs to accept that if they're going to be competing against other AAA studios in the same niche, they're just not going to be making games that can compete. The jury is still out on how X Defiant will stack up against Call of Duty, but considering Activision is literally repurposing planned DLCs into full price games, I think Ubisoft might actually have a shot. Furthermore, Ubisoft's second and third most profitable series are Just Dance and Far Cry, and I'd be willing to bet that this is because there really isn't anything like them on the market. My suggestion is to not shoot for spaces like competitive shooters or story-focused open-world single-player games, but rather aim for niches which have been strangely neglected. People have been begging for spiritual successes to titles like Left 4 Dead, Titanfall, and even fucking Skyrim. Most of these games are old enough that by simply shipping a solid game and having good post-launch support, they'd probably make fucking mint. Breakpoint was a fucking mess upon launch, Siege was pretty much a skeleton of its future self, and The Division 2 only found its footing long after its initial release. Despite this, they all went on to be adored by their respective player base, because Ubisoft rolled up their sleeves and put in the work. I'm not exactly saying that Ubi could do a better job making a movement shooter than Respawn Entertainment, or a co-op zombie game than Valve, but they sure as shit would do a better job supporting these games post-release. Give Ubisoft eight years, and they could probably make the best game in any genre they want. Skull and Bones, what did I tell you? We all know you would have been cancelled years ago if Ubisoft didn't take a giant grant from the government of Singapore. Now get the fuck out of here! 
By this stage, you've likely got some very strong opinions about what we've already covered, which is lucky for you because today's sponsor, Ipsos Isay, would love to have them. Ipsos is a nearly 50-year-old market research company willing to pay you for your opinions. In what might not be all that much of a surprise, companies very rarely understand their customers, meaning they're willing to pay big money to find out what makes you tick. The basic premise is simple. Ipsos will throw a few surveys your way on topics that interest you, and you'll be able to redeem credit for things like PayPal, DoorDash, or Amazon. I expect many of you have probably signed up to these types of survey apps before and never seen a cent for your time. But Ipsos is literally the third largest research agency in the world, so they need the opinions of as many people as they can. With this in mind, you're not about to grind up for a brand new Lambo or a beachfront house in Monaco. But you might make enough cash for your favorite battle pass or a month of Netflix every now and then, which isn't exactly a bad deal. If you could stand to earn a few easy dollars, a link to sign up to iSay will be down below. Because if your data is being sold anyway, the money is going to feel much better in your pocket. Now, let's get back to fixing the biggest game company in Europe. There might be something to be said about this kind of live service mentality of making the game and fixing it later that quite rightfully rubs a lot of people the wrong way. But I don't necessarily think it applies in this situation. If they can fill these niches by aiming for a solid 8, then player feedback can guide the rest of the development for as long as they're willing to play. Because as we've established, one of Ubi's biggest strengths is taking something mediocre and building upon it exponentially until it's arguably better than what anyone else could hope to produce. There's a reason no one else tries to make a competitor to Rainbow Six Siege, because no one in their right mind would attempt to take on a team with an 11 year head start. With all of these points out of the way, there's one particular genre which I believe would be absolute prime real estate for Ubisoft to swoop in and make their mark. A genre which has been plagued by player disappointment, developer misfortune, and has long been known as a space where AAA developers dare not tread. I'm of course talking about the open open world survival game. This space seems to have been dominated by indie developers launching early access titles which stay in a beta state for half a decade or more. And in almost all cases, these teams simply lack the manpower. Perhaps you see where I'm going with this. Valheim was made with just a five-man team, The Forest was made with four, and Minecraft was famously only developed by one determined conspiracy theorist. Even fucking Ubisoft Leamington, a place that sounds like I just made it up, has 50 employees on its own meaning Ubisoft could actually throw down a very consistent development roadmap. Assuming some higher level Ubisoft bigwig has made it this far into the video, firstly, welcome to the channel, and secondly, please, for the love of God, fix the PC launcher. I've logged in 50 times this year, and no matter how many times I click remember me, it keeps forgetting I logged in the day before. If there's one thing you take away from this video, please, for the love of fuck, let it be this. Anyway, for a survival crafting game, you'd want to make good use of Ubisoft's experience with hand-to-hand -hand fighting systems, but also its understanding of gunplay and modern combat. At the same time, you'll also want their expertise in crafting open worlds, while also giving developers the flexibility to build a big and diverse skill tree. To do this, you'll need a setting that lets the player use all of these different options, while also giving them an excuse to upgrade their base of operation. Here's what I'm thinking for the general premise. In our world, the US military has a special forces unit called the Green Berets, and part of their training is to drop into a country, train local rebels how to fight, and lead unconventional warfare in an occupied nation. In short, these guys are taught how to coup a country. In our theoretical game, however, a shadowy organization discovers the secret of time travel. And much like the Green Berets of today, they plan to subtly jump back to turning points in history, to tip power in their favor. Let's say they wanted to kill King Henry VIII and install a puppet or something. Someone smarter can think of something better. Your job is to go back in time and make sure this doesn't happen. Come to think of it, Assassin's Creed's modern setting barely makes any sense in the first place, so adding time travel wouldn't exactly be too much of a stretch. With how much the series has deviated from its earlier games, this shit isn't exactly pushing it much further. Fuck it, you're a modern time-traveling assassin stopping the Templar Order. The only difference is that you have guns and you get to build shit. 
and your friends can come along too. Now, it might be a bit too easy if players were given automatic rifles in the 15th century England, but this doesn't matter, because in our setting, time travel isn't quite an exact science. Although people seem to get sent back in time quite accurately, inanimate objects don't always land where and when you might like. This is why any equipment is sent back a few hundred years before players arrive, carefully hidden and preserved for when they can later be found. For a sense of progression, players will have to find modern weapons and equipment in the wild, and they'll need to dig up a 3D printer to upgrade their gear. In the meantime, you'll mostly just be using the weapons of the time. At this stage, viewers paying attention might be worried about butterfly effect bullshit, and how killing thousands of enemies over the game will affect the timeline. But there are ways to ride around this plot hole. Perhaps the time machine creates a saved state of the world, and perhaps some special artifact needs to be used to actually start recording on the timeline. This way, players can take a Bushmaster through the English countryside, murder hundreds of people, and teach the local peasants how to play All-Star by Smash Mouth, knowing that only their end objective really matters. Like all time travel shit, don't think about it too much. With this being said, it also adds a lot of potential for interesting encounters. Perhaps a local warlord found and managed to mass produce a weapon made for your mission. Maybe you can get an audience with a local lord if you help swing a battle a particular way. Or maybe witch hunters want you dead after interpreting your modern technology as some kind of unholy magic. Players would be allowed to choose if they want to lean into more modern tech, or embrace the ways of the time and become an unbeatable master at arms. Perhaps this would be made possible because the 3D printed ammunition doesn't work well with the locally produced materials, or that the sword fighting techniques taught before your mission are simply more advanced than those being used at the time. Maybe you could even create magic builds, but instead of actually being magic, they're just high-tech equipment disguised as wizard staffs to make it more in line with local folklore. Throw in cooperative raids with different builds and playstyles, and you start to see some serious potential. Ubisoft can pretty much draw experience for anything in the ways of sword fighting, gunplay, driving, or whatever else they might need. Because at one point or another, they've made most of these systems before. The one part they seem to be lacking is the base building and crafting component. With this being said, although Ubisoft aren't exactly great at reinventing the wheel, they're usually pretty good at replicating what a good wheel looks like, meaning this shouldn't really be an issue. This company employs 20,000 people. I'm sure one of them can make a good crafting system. As long as nothing is color-coded and has the description 5% better handling when on fire, we're on the right track. At the end of the process, we have an experience that works alone or cooperatively, in a niche that doesn't have any AAA competition, and in an area which actually plays to Ubisoft's strengths. Not only this, but survival crafting games aren't exactly known for needing incredible stories, meaning arguably their biggest weakness doesn't even matter. I've said this before, but a good game in this genre should feel like you're on a road trip with your friends, and the journey of building a base, hunting for treasure, and bringing down bosses will always be a better story than anything the narrative team could ever hope to write. Perhaps the best of all is that Ubisoft's derivative approach to game design will actually work in its favor, being able to combine the best parts of its other games and saving its R&D for shit that specifically applies to the survival crafting genre. Even better, the post-launch support content leaves a lot of room for expansion, with new raids, weapons, equipment, skills, and structures all being able to be infinitely added. And why stop there? You could even send these guys to the Roman Empire, feudal Japan, or the American American West, and it would all be the same concept. Hell, you could even make it a pirate-themed expansion with customizable ships, forts to take down and I won't tell you again, Skull and Bones! Get the fuck back in your cage! I suspect a big reason that AAA developers don't touch the survival craft genre is because it's hard to monetize. I'd like to say that Ubisoft will just be able to no man's sky this shit and drop 50 updates in a row without charging an extra dime, but I don't believe this genre would ever break into the AAA space without another way to generate revenue. I'm personally more of a fan of bigger and infrequent paid expansions, instead of trying to nickel and dime players with microtransactions. But that's just because I like the idea of earning cosmetics, a luxury which seems to have been lost to the sands of time. With all of this in mind, we'll want to give the game a name. Something catchy, easy to Google, and with a tiny hint of brand recognition. You could call it Tom Clancy's Assassin's Creed Far Cry, The Division become watchdogs for honor.
Ubisoft executives can find my contact information below. But until next time, have a fucking good one.